Hey everybody, I'm Mark Minette. I'm an Associate Professor of Film and Media Studies and English here at the University of South Carolina. Uh, I thought I'd take the opportunity today to talk to you a little bit about the uh, Gary Lee Watson Collection, your University Library Special Collections as part of our Hands-On Humanities series. A bit about how I use this in the classroom. So I'm a Professor of Film and Media Studies in English. I teach classes uh, on comics, including an Introduction to Comic Studies class and uh, a Superheroes Across Media class. And as part of both of these classes, I make use of the resources um, we're really super lucky to have here at the University of South Carolina Library Special Collections. One way I can make use of the collection is by illustrating the very complex histories of superheroes and superhero comics in my Superheroes Across Media class. One character has become uh, somewhat popular, maybe the less, one of the least appreciated or lesser appreciated characters in the Marvel Cinematic Universe is Hawkeye, um, played by Jeremy Renner. If I want to talk to my students about Hawkeye, I, I, I say Hawkeye and they immediately go to Jeremy Renner in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and use that as, as their anchor. So if you've ever seen any of these films, um, he's uh, a secret agent working with S.H.I.E.L.D. He was a partner with Black Widow. Right, who also um, retreats to his family in a farmhouse and uh, is about to get his own uh, Disney Plus series in, I think, November here in 2021. So I might use that as sort of an anchor. And then what I'll do is go back, bring out some of the comics from the Gary Lee Watson collection and use that to illustrate not just how complex the history of um, these characters as intellectual property can be, but also to illustrate some fundamental concepts that are, I think are useful for understanding the way in which intellectual property um, and franchises and individual characters move within media and move across media. So one point that I, I always try to make with students is that um, franchise characters and characters who appear in series, whether it's a TV series like Hawkeye is going to become or comic book series, um, it's highly iterative. So this idea that I've, I've borrowed from some other scholars of iterative cultural production is usefully illustrated, I think, by taking a deep dive into a single character. So let's take a look at the first appearance of Hawkeye in Tales of Suspense featuring the power of Iron Man number 57. So if you're only familiar with, um, if you're only familiar with Hawkeye from the movies, um, then this, as Hawkeye, is probably something that's a little bit startling to you. It's a little bit of a surprise. Uh, that when he originally appeared, right, he's not wearing a sort of sleek, dark uh, sort of jumpsuit. Instead, he's got swashbuckler boots, right? He's got uh, this pretty interesting looking mask on with the H, right? Um, this emblematic H on his forehead in case people forget how to begin to spell his name. Um, so sort of this... this sort of Robin Hood um, crossed with a superhero kind of uh, look, with I think a little bit of chain mail around the neck there. Now interestingly, so the character is introduced in the movies as a secret agent who gets manipulated into and, and sort of possessed and does the wrong thing in the first Avengers movie before he finally breaks free. There's this kind of correspondence there with the history of the character in the comic books. In his first appearance, Hawkeye, right, is presented as a bad guy. And if you look at the origins of Hawkeye as a super villain rather than a superhero, we can see some of what Peter Coogan talks about as, as conventions of the genre when it comes to supervillains. And here, because Marvel is doing at the time, and again, this is how going back to the original comics and using the collection can allow me to get at some fundamental points about um, comics, but also about understanding comic book history and key events in the history of comic books. Uh, Hawkeye is a Marvel character. Marvel was sort of reinventing the superhero comics. They were innovating, they were targeting them towards a slightly older audience, high school and college age uh, young people. And part of their approach was sort of desanctifying the superhero genre, um, as well as deepening character. So this origin of Hawkeye, like how he turns bad, is sort of an interesting play with this. Because if you look at it, what, is, what makes him turn bad? It's, it's that he's sort of a showman who, it's a, he's a showman who is uh, working with, uh, working at a carnival, and he gets upstaged by Iron Man. And so we get this moment where 
he's so fed up with Iron Man, he says, um, uh, I'll make myself a costume that no one will ever be able to forget, right? He's the greatest marksman in the world and everyone is ignoring him. So what's the motivation for him uh, to become a supervillain? Usually it's this sort of um, wound that uh, villains experience. Here the wound is just that he's humiliated by Hawkman. So it's a total ego thing um, here. That seems sort of slight and trivial and I think is, is maybe uh, intended to also be a little bit um, a little bit funny, not campy, but a little bit funny. And so then he emerges as Hawkeye. And if you're familiar with the character from the movies, you know that he has this partnership with the Black Widow, and originally they're doing bad things. Well, here, but for S.H.I.E.L.D., right, for the government, here they're doing bad things, right? Um, but it's because she's an agent with the Soviet Union. She sort of dupes Hawkeye, who's already pretty willing to do the, the wrong thing. Um, rather than the platonic relationship, the professional relationship in the movies, it starts out. Um, here with a romantic romantic interest, you know, based on his um, his his uh, physical interest in Black Widow, and that's a strain of sexism that the that the uh, the movies try to um, tamp down, I would say. So, what, interestingly, he doesn't stay a villain very long. He becomes an Avenger in Avengers number sixteen. He reforms um, in the same way by the end of the Avengers movie, right? He comes back to the good side. He stops being possessed. But unlike the Avengers movie, um, Hawkeye is not a founding Avenger um, then. So he's sort of added to the, the Avengers team in issue number 16, right? He reveals that uh, he's decided to reform in part because uh, of a tragedy with Black Widow. And the Avengers are effectively disbanding. Um, and this is a good opportunity to talk again about Marvel's original plan was to have a great continuity have a heavy series where all, we've got an all-star team of superheroes in the Avengers, right? Um, uh, Giant Man and the Wasp had their own series. Uh, Iron Man had his own series. Thor had his own series. And it just became too complicated for Stanley to manage. So instead, they replaced these superheroes in their all-star team with what's called, what came to be called the Kooky Quartet, which is Captain America, the conventional hero, along with two other former villains, um, these Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver from the X-Men films. So you can, you can if, you've if you've seen Avengers Age of Ultron, you can see how this gets revised in the movies, but again with the, their bad and then their good sort of trope. So Hawkeye joins uh, the team there, but what drives it, is not really about uh, it's not it's not about character per se. It's about managing continuity and the role that an all a former all star team book plays in this sort of complexity of, of managing continuity. Um, and at the end, you get a little hint of another development that's going to take place with Hawkeye, which is uh, that uh, he's saying, "Do we have enough strength to justify their confidence in us?" I wonder. Um, so I try to reinforce to my students that even though. There's, we think of like the comic book Hawkeye, this idea of a comic book Hawkeye, that doesn't mean that the character is the same, right? So iterative means that we've got a series, that there are constant, each issue is a new opportunity to make revisions, to make tweaks to the character. So here's an example, the Mighty Avengers number 63. This character on the cover is actually Hawkeye, rechristened as Goliath. So this new sort of start, this new origin for the character, and it's something that is, again, uh, triggered by his relationship to Black Widow. Note that Black Widow is now no longer um, just a secret agent, but she's a secret agent dressed like a superhero. And this idea of is there enough power comes back, right? Is he powerful enough? And this will be a key character trait that actually speaks to fan reactions to the character in the film. Why is this archer part of this super heroic team? He's really the weak link. The fact that he knows this is, speaks to Marvel's approach to characterization, right? And he's constantly trying to compensate. Part of his compensation earlier in the series is getting in constant fights with Captain America over who's the best, who should be leading the team. Here, written by Roy Thomas, um, he decides to tank, take Hank Pym's growth potion and become Goliath. So this is a change that doesn't last um, very long. The character is constantly uh, undergoing shifts, major and minor, one major shift, and here we're using another example of fan culture. Sometimes I like to bring in my own comics. This one's signed to me by the author of the series, Matt Fraction, um, by the writer of the series, Matt Fraction. And uh, the Ultimates imprint, which was a chance to relaunch a sort of a parallel line of comics by Marvel in the early 2000s, 
they um, they started a series called The Ultimates, which was a rethinking of the Avengers that in, that actually inspired a lot of the character designs and approach to character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Although this, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is much lighter in tone than the Ultimates line was. It's a lot less cynical than the Ultimates West line. So the character design that you're familiar with from the movies when it comes to Hawkeye comes from that Marvel Ultimates Hawkeye. And then what happens is it gets retranslated back into the comic book. So here we've got... Um, the Marvel mainline universe comic book Hawkeye rethought with a sort of minimalized um, outfit that looks a lot more like what you get in the movie, um, but that, unlike the movie, takes him down to become a street-level character, right? Unlike the movies, is a street-level character, one who would be pretty out of place going home to a family on a farm and, you know, has a dog um, who's going to be called Pizza Dog, right? And, you know, his, his enemies are sort of these running outfit wearing uh, bros, right? And if you've seen the trailer for the, the Hawkeye series um, coming up on Disney+, Plus, you're familiar. Maybe you've gotten a glimpse of these guys. So this is just an example of uh, how the Gary Lee Watson comic book collection can be used to uh, teach students. Um, it's, it's great to make important points about the history of comics, but important points about how franchises um, deal with characters, right, that we may think of being one thing, right, or we may think of being two things, when in fact they're multiple things. So, you know, I'm wearing this t-shirt which says that Clint is, Clint is dead because even though I really enjoy this version of Hawkeye that I pointed to earlier, right, the sort of revised version, and I enjoy the Ultimates version of Hawkeye, he sort of replaced um, the Hawkeye that I grew Grew up with. So this is sort of like my tongue-in-cheek um, uh, approach to that. And I didn't originate this t-shirt. It comes from a, a podcast, my fanboy podcast that I listen to. A bunch of dudes who are sort of my age. Um, but what's nice about it is, is that, again, this and other sort of material culture around comics that the Watson Collection um, contains, right, can be used to make um, important points that help students understand the media and their culture. Thanks.